Welcome to the Reischauer Center at uh, Seis Johns Hopkins University. Uh, I'm Kent Calder, the director of the center, and it's a real pleasure to have you with us today. We are privileged uh, to have as our guest today a, a distinguished uh, statesman, uh, Governor Denny Tamaki, the uh, governor of Okinawa uh, Prefecture in Japan, uh, who, as you know, uh, we are participating virtually, of course, but it's a privilege uh, to have uh, him with us. Uh, governor Tamaki has served as governor uh, of Okinawa since August of 2018. Um, he served previously uh, as a member of Japan's House of Representatives, the first Amerasian to uh, fill that role from uh, 2009 to 2012, and then again from 2014 to 2018. Prior to that, um, he was a member of the Okinawa Prefectural Assembly, representing uh, Okinawa City, uh, very close to major American bases, including uh, Kadena, from uh, 2002 to 2005. Um, our, so it's a real pleasure to uh, have him with us uh, to, to uh, present a question which is of particularly important, uh, both contemporary and also uh, historical importance. We are just passing the uh, 25th anniversary of the uh, FDEMA agreement uh, between President uh, Bill Clinton and Prime Minister Hashimoto of Japan uh, in 1996. I can remember myself in uh, February of, 2000, uh, of 1997 uh, visiting uh, Hinoko for the first time. And um, of course, that whole question of the future of the FDEM uh, uh, Marine Corps Air Station and what would happen to it has been a major issue in US-Japan relations over that period. So we look forward to uh, hearing Ambassador or uh, uh, Governor Tamaki and then uh, to uh, the distinguished panelists, um, all of the presenters today have spent time with uh, U.S. Embassy Tokyo on the American side, and of course, uh, Governor Tamaki to uh, present the situation on the Okinawan side. So uh, with that, Governor uh, Tamaki, it's an honor and a pleasure uh, to have you with us, and we look forward to your remarks. よろしいですかはい。はい。え、ハイサイ、グスヨチュウがなびら。沖縄県知事の玉木デニーです。沖縄の、え、言葉でご挨拶をさせていただきましたが、こんにちは。皆さんご機嫌いかがですかというような表現
小学校、10校など、また多くの教育施設が位置しています。また、市役所などの公共施設も多数位置しています。このような状況について、2003年にこの飛行場を上空から視察した当時のアメリカの国防長官であるラムズフェルド氏は、世界一危険な飛行場だと感想を述べたと言われています。実際に2004年8月にこの飛行場所属のヘリコプターが沖縄国際大学に墜落・炎上する事故が発生しましたこのほかにもこれまで多くの事故が発生しており先月も MV22 オスプレイから金属製の水筒が住宅地に落下するなど周辺住民は不安な生活を送っております日常の訓練による騒音被害も大きな課題です最も大きな音で約120デシベルと近くで雷が落ちた時の音量で聴覚機能にも障害が起きうるレベルだと言われていますさらに PFAS を含む泡消火剤が基地の外に流出する事故も発生していますこれらのことから普天間飛行場の危険性の除去は国、沖縄県、宜野湾市の共通の認識となっています県内の民意は普天間飛行場の県内移設に反対です。このことは2015年および2018年の県知事選挙や2019年に実施された県民投票で明確に示されています。現在、名護市辺野古では政府による新基地の建設工事が進められていますが、県としては反対の立場です。次に普天間飛行場の辺野古移設に県が反対する理由についてを申し上げます。まずはやはり過重な米軍基地の負担です。日本の国土面積の 0.6% しかない沖縄に 70.3% の米軍専用施設が集中しています。このほか広大な訓練水域や空域も存在しています。さらに新しい基地には普天間飛行場にはない新たな機能が整備されることとされており、沖縄の過重な基地負担や基地負担の格差を永久化し、固定化するものです。反対する理由の次に圧倒的な民意です。これまでの沖縄県知事選挙において、辺野古移設に反対する民意が示されていますし、さらに2019年2月には、辺野古埋め立てに絞ったワンイシューで県民投票が行われ、71.7% という反対の民意が示されましたしかしながら日米両政府ともに辺野古が唯一という解決策の姿勢を変えず県民の願い思いを顧みることなく工事は強行されています次に辺野古浦和の豊かな自然環境についてお話しします辺野古浦和は生物多様性の極めて高い水域です、海域です。この海域では、国指定天然記念物のジュゴンをはじめとする絶滅危惧種262種を含む5300種以上の生物が確認されています。このうちの1300種は、いわゆる未記載種が含まれています。新種や国内初めての記録の種類となる可能性のあるものです。また、海外の世界自然遺産と比べても高い生物多様性です。例えば、ハワイの世界自然遺産登録地は151平方キロメートルで7000種類ですが、辺野古浦湾は20平方キロメートルに5300種類が生息しています。この海域の自然環境の重要性は、日本生態系学会をはじめとした19もの学会の共同声明でも指摘されているほか、環境省はこの海域をラムサール条約の登録湿地の国際基準を満たす潜在候補地として抽出しています。また、シルビア・ R 博士が率いる環境 NGO ミッションブルーにより、大浦湾とその周辺海域一帯が2019年10月に日本で初めてのホープスポットとして登録されています。次に軟弱地盤についてお話しします。軟弱地盤はこの辺野古新基地建設に関して
技術的、財政的な課題となっているものと考えています。まず技術的な課題です。辺野古新基地の建設予定地の大浦湾海底には、非常に緩く柔らかい、いわゆるマヨネーズ状だと言われている軟弱地盤が広範囲に分布しています。面積では約66ヘクタールと、大浦湾の埋め立て区域の約6割に当たります。また、水深で水面下90メートルにまで、その軟弱地盤は存在しています。そのため、新基地を建設するためには、直径2メートルほどの砂の杭を7万本以上打ち込む大規模な地盤改良工事が必要ですが、国内の地盤改良をするための技術的な船は、水面下70メートルまでしか地盤改良工事の施工実績がありません。特に一番水深が深い B27 地点では力学的調査が実施されておらず、そこから離れた別の3つの地点の力学的試験の結果から類推して結果を求めており、不十分な調査となっています。また、新基地建設予定地の直下とその近くには、二つの断層が存在しますが、地質学者はこれらの断層が地震発生時のリスクの高い活断層であると指摘をしています。次に財政的な課題をお話しします。2019年に日本の防衛省が明らかにした総経費は当初契約額約2300億円の4倍に達する9300億円になっています。これまでの経費を経緯を踏まえると、今後もこの額は増えていく可能性が十分にあります。新基地建設予定地には、緩い地盤と硬い地盤が混在しています。地盤が浅い部分と深い部分では、不均一に沈む不動沈下が長期にわたり発生する恐れがあります。そのため、仮に完成しても、維持管理には莫大な経費を要する恐れがあり、米国の費用負担が増加することにもつながります。また、この不動沈下は、基地の安定的な運用に支障となる可能性が高く、基地の運用上の課題ともなりますでしょう。以上のように、辺野古新基地建設は、軟弱地盤などにより、技術的にも財政的にも多くの課題があるため、建設予定地としては適切ではないと考えられます。日米両政府は、普天間飛行場の移設先として、辺野古が唯一の解決策と繰り返し発言をしています。政府が辺野古を唯一とするのは国内に他の移設先が探せない政治的な理由です。かつて防衛大臣を務めた方も在任中に軍事的には沖縄でなくてもいいと認めており、すべてを兼ね備えた状況を政治的に許容できるのは沖縄しかないと発言しています。辺野古移設に反対する県民の民意は、この無視され続けており、民主主義の問題でもあると考えています。沖縄県は辺野古が唯一の解決策とする具体的な根拠などについては、政府から一切具体的な説明を受けたことはありません。1996年の佐古合意から25年経過した現在、安全保障環境は変化しています。中国や北朝鮮などのミサイル能力の向上により、沖縄の米軍基地は脆弱化していると言われています。このことは、数万人の在沖米国人にも影響があります。また、米軍自身の部隊の分散化や、米海兵隊総司令官の海兵隊はインド太平洋の部隊を分散化しなければならないとの発言もあります。CSIS の2020年11月の報告書では、辺野古の普天間代替施設の計画は困難続きであり、完成することはないように思われるとされています。先ほどご説明した通り、大浦湾には軟弱地盤が存在しています。このため、沖縄防衛局は2020年4月に軟弱地盤の改良工事などを内容とする普天間飛行場代替施設建設計画の変更を沖縄県に申請しました。沖縄県では提出された変更承認申請書について、こういう水面埋め立て法への適合状況を確認するため、沖縄防衛局に対しては延べ39項目
452件の質問を行いました沖縄防衛局の回答を踏まえ慎重に論点の絞り込みを行い土木及び環境に関する専門家の助言を求め公有水面埋め立て法への適合性については災害防止及び環境保全に十分配慮した計画となっているかなど厳正に審査をしてまいりましたその審査の結果本件埋め立て変更承認申請書については2021年今年の11月25日付で不承認とする行政処分を行ったところです次に不承認の理由についてです本件埋め立て変更承認申請書については1軟弱地盤に関する必要な調査が実施されていないほか地盤の安定性などについて説明がされていないこと2ジュゴンに及ぼす影響について調査や対策の検討が行われていないほか海底が最大で14メートル盛り上がる可能性に対して環境保全に配慮した検討が実施されていないこと三、軟弱地盤に関する調査が十分でなく埋め立ての動機となる普天間飛行場の危険性の早期の除去につながらないということそして四、これらのことなど法で定めた要件を満たさないということから変更の内容につ,いてついては認められないとして11月25日付で不承認としたところです。今般の変更申請が不承認となった以上、沖縄防衛局は大浦湾側の工事を行うことができず、結果として埋め立て工事全体を完成させすることのできる見通しが立たない状況となります。埋め立て工事が周辺環境に与える影響は甚大であり、かつ不可逆的であることからすると、事実上無意味なものとなる可能性がある埋め立て工事をこれ以上継続することは許されることではありません。このため、沖縄防衛局においては、今回の計画変更に関する工事のみならず、すべての埋め立て工事を中止すべきものと考えております。沖縄県としては、辺野古が唯一の解決策とは言えないものと考えています。何より、辺野古移設では、この問題の原点である普天間飛行場の一日も早い危険性の除去にはつながらないと考えており、日米両政府には辺野古が唯一との固定観念にとらわれず再検討をお願いしたいと考えていますそして沖縄県としては辺野古新基地建設問題の解決には政府との対話が重要であると考えており対話により解決策を求める民主主義の姿勢を求めていくこととしています最後に本日の講演を聞いていただいている米国を含む皆様へお願いです米国の財産である米軍基地、米国民の大切な存在である米軍人、米軍基地で働いている皆様について、米国の意思で問題を見つめるべきと考えています。辺野古新基地建設は予算がいくらかかるかわからない、いつ建設が終わるか明確ではないという問題があります。このような問題点について米側自身がしっかりと調査して現実を明らかにするべきと考えておりまた、えー、アメリカの連邦政府連邦議員皆様の地域の議員や政府にぜひ国民の皆さんからも訴えていただきたいと考えています普天間飛行場辺野古新基地建設問題は沖縄で起きている問題であり日本政府も当事者ですがその基地を使用する米国も当事者であると考えていただきたいのです皆様にはぜひ自分事と,として捉え、地域の議員や政府に訴えていただきたいと思います。この問題は民主主義の問題であると考えます。日米の安全保障は重要であり、沖縄県は日米安全保障体制を容認する立場であります。そのためには沖縄に過度の負担が生じることがあってはならないと考えています。沖縄県はこれまでに何度も民主主義の手続きに従って、県民の民意を示し続けており、このことについてぜひ認識をしていただきたいと思います。民主主義の国である米国の皆様の民主主義の力が、行動が民主主義の将来のあるべき姿をしっかりと示してくれるものと信じています。今後とも普天間飛行場辺野古新基地建設問題をはじめとする沖縄の米軍基地問題に関心を寄せていただきますようよろしくお願いいたします。
、最後までご清聴いただきありがとうございました。一平二平デイビタン、Thank you very much。Thank you very much,、um, Governor Tamaki, for your remarks.、Um, we appreciate your、um, ideas, and we certainly、um, also understand and, and appreciate what you say about the importance of democratic dialogue.、Um, to present another view of the issues、uh, regarding.、Uh, Bases in, in Okinawa, and particularly, of course, the、uh, FEMA and Hinoko issues.、Um, we're privileged to have today assistant,、uh, former Assistant、uh, Secretary of Defense for East Asian Pacific Affairs and、uh, a diplomat who has long experience with、uh, issues in Okinawa as former、uh, director of the Political、uh, minister, counselor of the U.S. Embassy Tokyo, ambassador to Vietnam, a, a range of positions in the State Department as well as the Defense Department, but has been concerned with and dealt with Okinawa issues for many years. And so it gives me pleasure、uh, to present、uh, my colleague、uh, today, also、um, former ambassador and now. Um, professor and senior fellow of the Reischauer Center,、uh, David Shear. Professor Shear. Thank you very much, Kent, and thank you, Governor Tamaki, for that very eloquent presentation. And it's a great honor to be appearing with you on this panel today. I want to start by recalling that I've worked on Okinawan affairs throughout much, I worked on Okinawa, Okinawan affairs throughout much of my career in the State Department. Both at Embassy Tokyo and in Washington. And I've been in Okinawa multiple times,、uh, starting when I was a student at Waseda way back in 1974 when they were building the,、uh, preparing for the Kayun Haka. I was the political military unit chief in Tokyo in 1995 when the rape crisis occurred, when we reinterpreted the SOFA on custody, and when we renegotiated the Sako Agreement. I remember the anger and resentment on Okinawa and throughout Japan stirred by the rape. And these experiences sharp, sharpened the appreciation I have for the contributions and sacrifices that Okinawans make for the US Japan Alliance and for the defense of Japan. I also developed a fine sense of the balance US officials must maintain between military operations designed to defend Japan and maintain stability in the region. And the safety and comfort of the Okinawan people who live near our bases. I should stress that the views expressed in my presentation are my own. I'm no longer a US government official and I don't represent the US government, but I do want to provide a Washington perspective. I'm not going to try to rebut everything the governor said point by point. I've been asked to discuss the strategic situation. In Northeast Asia and its likely effects on Okinawa, and that's what I'll do.、Uh, and with regard to the current regional situation, I, you can say I think that it's defined primarily by competition between China and the United States and the, its allies and partners. We face a threat from North Korea for a long time, and it remains very important for both Japan and the United States. But competition with China will define regional international relations for the foreseeable future. Intensifying competition between the US and China displays a number of characteristics. First, fear and distrust. The Chinese fear that the United States wants to contain China and ultimately overthrow the Communist Party. On the other hand, the United States fears that China wants to diminish our alliances and ultimately drive us out of the region. As Henry Kissinger has said, diplomacy must operate in the space between these two poles. And that's a pretty narrow space indeed. The second characteristic is a burgeoning regional arms race. The PLA has been expanding, reorganizing, and modernizing its military forces 
since the 1990s. China has been the dominant land power in Asia for decades now. It now threatens to become a dominant sea power as well. The US has responded by reshuffling our strategic priorities, by shifting resources from other regions to the Indo-Pacific region, and modernizing our forces. Japan and Australia are also increasing their defense budgets, modernizing their forces, and expanding their roles, missions, and operational ranges. The US, its allies, and like-minded countries like India are also cooperating more closely di diplomatically and militarily through groupings like the Quad. Third, the competition is spilling into economic, technological, and informational spheres, although it's lamentable that the administration has yet to craft a credible alternative economic strategy to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Is this competition, can you call this competition a new Cold War? Well, it certainly doesn't resemble the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. It isn't defined by military confrontation across well-defined lines of defense. It isn't defined by, I, I necessarily by ideological conflict, but it is characterized, unlike the Cold War with the Soviet Union, it is characterized by strong economic interdependence among the players. There's a solid consensus in Washington that we have to meet the challenges that China poses across the board, but a consensus on how to do this is still emerging. This is evident in the military sphere. All US military services know that they have to change, change in order to effectively deter and compete with the PLA. But the services strategies, including Marine Force Design 2030, are still gestational. The good news is that the Biden administration wants a stable relationship with China and is looking for ways of cooperating as well as ways of competing with Beijing. China's performance at COP26 is an encouraging case in point. I think that the president's recent, recent conversation with President Xi demonstrates both sides' interest in keeping the relationship within, guard, guard, within the guardrails. Unlike the Trump administration, this administration has also kept open lines of communication with senior Chinese civilian and military leaders. Overall, I think that President Biden wants to ensure that we use all the tools of statecraft to compete with China, not just the military tool. The US and its allies will gain advantage vis-a-vis -vis China only to the extent that we conduct a vis uh, vigorous and well-coordinated regional diplomacy. Our allies will be as important now as they were during the Cold War, if not more so. The Biden administration understands this far better than the Trump administration, and we can see this clearly in the intensity with which the current administration has interacted with its Japanese counterparts bilaterally, trilaterally with the ROK, and quadrilaterally with Japan, Australia, and India. It should be clear from this that the competition with China is not just between the US and China, but between China and an increasingly coordinated coalition that includes Japan. Achieving an adequate level of deterrence will be key to establish, not, it, it will be key not just to competing with China, but to establishing stable relations with China under the conditions of great power competition. With regard to Taiwan, very close, of course, to Okinawa and the other, the southern end of the Nansei Shoto. Tensions across the Taiwan Strait have risen dramatically recently, but I don't believe war is likely anytime soon. Chinese military activities in the vicinity of Taiwan have a quality of ritual intimidation. President Xi has not set any firm deadlines for reunification, and we don't see widespread preparations for invasion on the PRC side of the strait, even though they're conducting fairly extensive uh, exercises right now, I think. I believe that the Chinese don't want to resort to war in order to reunify Taiwan. They continue to think that they can reunify with Taiwan peacefully through subversion. They also believe that the biggest obstacle to success is continued American support 
for Taiwan's democracy and growing Japanese support for Taiwan's democracy as well. But the Chinese won't abandon the possible use of force and they've deployed and operate considerable forces across the strait from Taiwan. That's why the US and Japan must ensure adequate deterrence in the Western Pacific and the US can no longer do it alone. We'll also need to continue deterring future leaders on Taiwan from declaring in in independence. This dual deterrent message is the only way to ensure stability across the Taiwan Strait. I understand that Okinawans don't want to be the target of aggression, but I believe, and I think most people in, in the national security in Washington believe that uh, uh, preventing Okinawa from becoming a target of aggression will be best accomplished through strong deterrence and not a precipitate American withdrawal from the first island chain. Under the circumstances, Okinawa is increasingly strategic. For deterrence in Taiwan Strait, for deterrence in the Taiwan Strait and in the East China Sea as well. The Miyako Strait and the Yonaguni Channel are also increasingly strategic. That's why the Japanese government decided to shift the Self Defense Force's strategic focus from the Northeast to the Southwest and to move more military assets to Yonaguni, Miyakojima, and Ishigaki. In order to ensure adequate deterrence, the US is reviewing both our military service strategies and our regional military posture. Force Design 2030 is the Marine's effort to shape a new strategy. The Global Posture Review is an effort to ensure our forces globally and in the, in the Indo-Pacific region are adequately arrayed. Force Design 2030 places a strong emphasis on the Indo-Pacific region and on the use of small mobile units operating within the first island chain armed with anti-ship and air defense weapons to support fleet operations. The Marines have dubbed this the Expeditionary Advanced Base Operations concept. The primary organizational unit under this concept will be the Marine Littoral Combat Regiment. A recent CSIS report indicates that the Marines plan to transform all three regiments of the 3rd Marine Division into new marine littoral regiments with one each in Okinawa, Guam, and Hawaii. The Global Posture Review was completed this month. It res its results are classified, but the public statement on the review issued by the Defense Department doesn't reveal much. In the region, it appears to focus on strengthening our forces, particularly in Guam and Australia. And I'm not aware of any specific plans for Japan or Okinawa, but that doesn't mean there aren't any. While increased tensions in China may lead to increased US and Japanese operational tempos in the Southwest, it doesn't appear to me that increases in American personnel strength in Okinawa are being planned. In fact, the Marine Corps remains committed to the DPRI plan to move up to 9,000 Marines to Guam, Hawaii and Australia. It also appears to me that both the U US government and the government of Japan are committed to building the Futenma replacement facility even after becoming aware of the seabed problem in the area of Hinoko. Both sides also think that we need an airfield at Hinoko in the event of a contingency. In fact, the US will need lots of airfields in the region to which it can gain access in the event of a contingency. Before I look to the future, I think it should be noted that the Defense Policy Review Initiative or the DPRI has achieved some successes. We've moved Marine C-130s to Iwakuni. We've returned large tracts of land, including over half of the Northern Training Area and Camp Foster's West Futenma Housing Area. We also have moved a considerable amount of Marine training off island. The good news for the future is that the US and Japan appear to be putting the pieces into place necessary for the movement of Marines out of Okinawa per successive agreements since 2006. Guam's Camp Blas, to be the home of 5,000 of the 9,000 Marines moved from Okinawa, was commissioned last year. And Marines are projected to start moving in 2024. I think that both sides sh should consider possible further land returns south of Kadena that can be agreed upon quickly 
prior to a move to the FRF and the return of Futenma. I understand that both sides worked out a set of modest returns during Ambassador Kennedy's tenure. The U.S. side should be willing to entertain further such returns. Again, I've been a fan from Okinawa since I was there as a student, and I wish the island well as it tries to recover the, from the blight of COVID. Thank you very much, and thanks again, Governor Tamaki. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Shear, uh, for your remarks. Um, next, as our next uh, presenter, we have someone uh, who also is very familiar with Okinawa here at the Reichshauer Center. He has published uh, two monographs uh, relating to Okinawa. Um, Dr. Uh, William Brooks, uh, who also served with the U.S. Embassy uh, Tokyo for uh, 15 years. And it's a real pleasure to have him, as well as, uh, of course, Ambassador Scheer with us uh, today to discuss these important issues. Uh, Dr. Brooks, we look forward to your remarks. Thank you very much, Kent. Uh... Uh, and thank you, Governor Tamaki, for your very persuasive presentation. Uh, I, I learned a lot from it. And also, uh, Ambassador Scheer, uh, I also appreciated your insightful brief uh, showing the strategic importance of the bases in Okinawa. Uh, I will not try to step on your lines uh, too much <laughs> in my own presentation. Uh, my uh, relationship with uh, Okinawa actually goes back to uh, about my teenage years when I, I was in the U.S. Air Force uh, as a, uh, a radio operator and was stationed to Okinawa, Kadena Air, Air Base, uh, for a while in the early 60s. Um, but I, I have to uh, emphasize that my most uh, important uh, contacts, I would say, with Okinawa was after the 1995 rape incident, uh, when I was sent down several times by the political section uh, in order to gauge the mood. Uh, and we did a, an enormous amount of translation in the translation unit uh, that I uh, then headed, uh, concerned uh, with uh, the views of Okinawa, uh, and also on the uh, the um, issue of uh, Futema uh, in 1996. So, um, and after that, I have also had other experiences in Okinawa, some uh, very pleasurable vacations with my wife, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So my experience with Okinawa, uh, trans, it's part of my whole career, uh, both with the U.S. government and academia. Um, my presentation today focuses on the brief briefly on the history of the um, MCAS Futemma relocation issue. Perhaps we should call it the Futemma saga since it starts in 1996, 25 years ago. Uh, and if left as, as is, will likely take another decade or more to complete, if ever. Uh, you all see what I mean in a bit, but let me sh first share my screen with you. I have a, a brief number of slides. Uh, some of them might duplicate the slides that you saw with uh, the governor. There we go. Um, so I am not concerned here with strategic issues, only with the history of this very, very uh, difficult uh, issue. Uh, so uh, why has it taken so long? Well, over the decades, uh, over the decades, there's a lot of blame that can be uh, pointed in all direction. It lies on all sides, but I'm not here to point any fingers. I just want to explain part of the torturous process that has led to the current state of affairs. A base promised by the U.S. at that time to be closed uh, within uh, five or six, seven years, uh, but still open now and as busy as ever. Uh, and a replacement facility, an FRF, Futema replacement facility, that was supposed to be finished ages ago and is now uh, stalled, uh, perhaps indefinitely. And there have been four different plans. Uh, there was a SACO plan, uh, strategic uh, plan in uh, 1996, 
Uh, there was a Camp Schwab plan uh, in 2005, 2006. There was a Guam and Okinawa plan in 2011, 2012. There was an Okinawa cons consolidation plan in 2013, 2015. So um, um, we're now back to uh, plan um, B, I would say, uh, the, the stall plan of uh, uh, Henneco Point, uh, a V-shaped runway. So one plan after the other. Utema, as you can see here, uh, is located in the middle of Ginoan City. Uh, uh, it's surrounded by a highly dense population, many schools, hospitals. In 2004, uh, one of the helicopters actually crashed into the uh, campus uh, of the university right next door. So uh, the location itself uh, is a no-brainer. It should have been closed a long time ago and was promised to be closed. Uh, but the flights now, right now, 25 years after promising, uh, according to uh, the, the press, it's reported that in the first half of this fiscal year alone, the number of military flights at Futema, including transient aircraft, reached 9,800 in a half a year alone, a near record. The record was actually reached in fiscal 2020. Um, so the base has been intensified with training and flight operations due to China's increasingly assertive uh, actions in the region. Uh, the East China Sea and the Taiwan Strait have made uh, Futema has re have revived to Futema for the time being. So uh, a, a promise made can hardly be kept if a, if a, a base is kept at full capacity. Uh, this development to me indicates that there really isn't a lot of planning that Futema will be closed down soon. Uh, and uh, to uh, reiterate perhaps what was earlier said, there is no backup now for Futema. So uh, the, the basic flaw, uh, I, this is my, one of my main arguments, the basic flaw from the beginning was to promise to return Futema uh, and link it to uh, uh, the completion of a relocation site in another part of Okinawa. All of this, of course, began with the schoolgirl school rape in 1995, leading to huge protests in Okinawa. Uh, Futema became uh, uh, the symbol of the overpresence of the U.S. bases. Uh, it, there, it became a national issue. Uh, and to resolve the issue, the U.S. agreed to return uh, Futema uh, to Japan, uh, but linked linked to uh, having a replacement facility (FRF) uh, built uh, in uh, uh, inside inside of Okinawa. That was the uh, the original plan. Um, and Ambassador Mondale played a key role in this early uh, decision. Uh, the Futema Marine Corps Station. Uh, will be closed and returned to Japan. And note the time frame: five to seven years. Uh, the Harrier jets uh, will return to the U.S. Uh, helicopters and uh, tanker planes will move to other sites in Japan, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then the, uh, the the SACO or the Security Consultative Committee meeting for SACO uh, made a decision in December of 1996. Uh, to relocate, uh, re close, relocate Futema Air Station uh, and the relocation of its assets to other facilities and areas in Okinawa. Uh, and at that time, three alternatives were seriously considered. Incorporate the heliport uh, into Kadena Air Base, uh, or perhaps have a, a heliport uh, into uh, uh, Camp Schwab, and develop and construct a sea-based facility. Uh, the SBF or sea based facility was the one that was chosen, and I'll get to that in a second. But if indeed, uh, perhaps the second option had been chosen to just build a heliport at Camp Schwab, we wouldn't be in this mess right now. So why was an SBF chosen? I think the next slide will explain a little bit of that. Uh, <clears throat> 
Oh, okay, I'm sorry. It, it's not on the slide. It's in my own notes. <laughs> my apologies. Uh, a declassified diplomatic document dated March 19th, 1996, was recently uh, revealed as in a, a newspaper item, uh, December 2nd, 2021. And in this declassified document, Ambassador Mondale expressed a hesitancy towards the idea of returning Futemba. Uh, and the, the negotiations with that DOD led uh, eventually uh, uh, listened uh, to uh, the view that, uh, okay, uh, the teleport option is a no, 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 uh, a non-starter. Uh, and it went with the SBF, the sea-based facility option. Um, it reflects, I think, and this is my interpretation, uh, it reflects the Taiwan Strait incident that had happened with uh, China uh, in 1996. And second, uh, uh, the need to have uh, an SBF, a large, huge uh, uh, facility similar to Futema, uh, so that the, the, back, the backup runway during any contingency uh, would be uh, available. Uh, so the, the decision to do an SBF uh, to construct this huge uh, facility in the middle of Oura Bay eventually uh, was chosen uh, with the uh, uh, idea of putting in piles uh, and, and uh, steel construction into the, uh, uh, in, into the bay and then put this huge uh, runway uh, similar to uh, uh, the, the length of uh, Futema on top of it. Uh, so uh, they were supposed to do this all within five to seven years. Uh, uh, it was a pipe dream, uh, literally a pipe dream. It never happened. There was an enormous amount of environmental uh, uh, damage that was expected from that. Uh, uh, the, uh, there were protests even on the water. So eventually the idea of constructing this sea-based facility was given up. So uh, the next idea then, uh, and uh, was during uh, a, a, a second set of negotiations, the US-Japan Roadmap for Realignment Implementation uh, in May 2006. And here, uh, the idea of uh, getting, scrapping the uh, SBF and putting in a V-shaped runway, uh, which was supposed to be uh, uh, designed so that there would be very little uh, over flights uh, over the Hedoko town. Uh, and it would have a length of 1,600 meters uh, with two 100 uh, meter overruns. The original uh, size of uh, Futema is about 2,700, 2,800 meters. So this one is really short. Uh, and uh, this obviously could not handle uh, the uh, large uh, KC-130s and other large aircraft that are or were then at Fatemba. So those large aircrafts uh, by 2014 were all relocated to uh, the uh, Iwakuni in, in Kyushu. So the only thing left uh, on Fatemba officially after the, that move uh, while this new plan was being uh, uh, formulated, uh, would be uh, uh, the uh, uh, the helicopters and then later the uh, Ospreys, 24 Ospreys, uh, which uh, rise up uh, straight uh, just like uh, the uh, the helicopters do. And the uh, the 2006 deadline, uh, the set was for completion of the FRF at Henoko. Uh, in 2014. And here is the uh, the design of Henoko Point. Prior to the project, uh, it would straddle Henoko Point and go off into the uh, shallow waters and slightly deeper waters uh, off each side of the point. This is the current state of landfill at the Henoko relocation site, uh, the one that the, the governor talked about that has hit all kinds of problems. It's a the landfill I think is only about one third complete uh, and the rest of it has run into trouble. So the, the V-shaped runway uh, actually uh, was designed with the help of local uh, residents of the city of Nago nearby 
And uh, the original idea of having this short runway was to make it uh, into a joint, at some point, a joint civilian uh, military uh, airport, and then eventually uh, uh, we would supposedly be turned over to the civilian side, and it would be used for civilian aircraft uh, in northern part of uh, Okinawa. Well, that never happened, uh, and of course now it's, it's strictly a military, uh, a military facility. Uh, but uh, it was indeed uh, originally a compromise based on dialogue with local government and local residents. So uh, just think about it then. The first plan was to build this huge base uh, equal to the size of Futema. The current plan is a small runway that can only accommodate small aircraft, ospreys, and helicopters. Uh, it is not a backup for Futema. Futema does not have a backup plan. Uh, there is no backup plan. Uh, uh, it is designed uh, originally uh, after the uh, uh, Korean War as a UN designated backup runway. Uh, what's going to happen if it's closed? What, what uh, facility? Henoko is never going to be able to, to be any backup for anything. It's just going to be a parking lot for helicopters and ospreys. It has no strategic function. So my main argument uh, today is that it is not necessary. And now that it has run into uh, a real trouble uh, because of the, uh, the soft uh, mayonnaise-like seabed uh, that nobody seemed to realize until about a year or, or about, about two or three years ago, uh, it has, has run into a major, major, major problem. And it is possible that uh, the technology to put in pilings uh, up to 90 meters, uh, 70 to 90 meters, may be technologically difficult, uh, and it could be even more further delayed. So we're thinking about, you know, possibly another 10 or so years to finish the uh, the project at Henoko. Uh, we're thinking about maybe uh, the mid 2030s uh, at the at the earliest, perhaps of closing down uh, Futema. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's not a strategic idea uh, at all. Um, my suggestion is quite simple. Uh, and I'm not saying to, to stop this uh, particular Hanoko project. I think it'll just fade away by itself because it'll be impossible to complete. But it is possible to take the Ospreys and the helicopters and put them somewhere else, uh, maybe uh, in Kyushu at some other air base, uh, whether it's an SDF air base or perhaps a uh, Iwakuni-like air base, uh, and uh, close down the facility. And if you need to designate a backup, well, maybe one of the major bases at uh, the uh, uh, in Kyushu could be designated uh, as a backup air base, one of the SDF uh, runways, perhaps. At any rate, uh, the original idea of having Henoko in Okinawa uh, for the helicopters was because the helicopters have a very, very short range uh, in their flight. But the, uh, the Ospreys can go, uh, uh, you know, a thousand miles or so. Uh, there is no reason why, why uh, the Marines uh, have to be right next to uh, uh, their uh, uh, bases. Uh, you could have an Osprey come over from Okinawa and pick them up. Uh, and, and of course, uh, as uh, uh, Ambassador Shear mentioned, uh, the, the marine presence will be halved, will be cut in half as uh, um, strategic plans to move them to different parts of the region. Uh, the, the projects in Guam that uh, Japan is paying a hefty price to build. Uh, so the Marines will only be about 11,000 uh, in uh, a few years. Uh, so it isn't a big stretch to think of other interim interim solutions uh, to close Futema and relieve the misery that uh, that base has caused uh, so long and so uh, difficult. So my concluding remarks is that uh, uh, 
despite the um, uh, this, despite the uh, uh, the argument the argument that has been made that the Henoko uh, facility uh, is an important strategic uh, 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 point, uh, uh, a very important strategic part of the deterrence uh, of, uh, of the bases. Uh, my argument is that uh, from a, a political, from a military viewpoint, uh, it is not strategic. Uh, the position uh, uh, to keep it there uh, and to continue it is a political decision, and a political decision could also reverse that. Um, but that is way beyond my capability to influence. But uh, uh, it is logical to uh, close the base that's been promised. The base should be closed, I think. Uh, and the, the remaining part of Futema's functions, the Ospreys, et cetera, could be put uh, on another uh, air, airfield uh, uh, in uh, Kyushu or elsewhere. Uh, perhaps even some of them could be put in Kadena uh, Air Base. Uh, close the place down. Uh, uh, the promises were made. The promises were broken and broken and broken. It should be closed down. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I close my presentation. Well, we've had a, a very interesting uh, discussion so far. And um, I think uh, this is the basis for a very interesting discussion and in some ways a debate um, of the strategic issues regarding um, the broad uh, U.S. presence in Okinawa have been uh, presented by Ambassador Scheer and uh, then the details, of course, of the uh, transition of the FRF and the movement from Hino, from uh, Femma to Hinoko and the tactical, the narrower political logic, of course, um, have been presented by Dr. Brooks. And um, Governor Tamaki has given us a, a very interesting uh, presentation as well. So uh, the floor is open for questions as uh, people are beginning to uh, send in questions, and I see that uh, the number is increasing now. We have some that are, I think, very important. I have to say, in the background, just personally having worked on these issues myself for a long time, apart from the narrow questions of Denma itself, in the broader relationship of Okinawa and the world, Okinawa and the United States, Okinawa and Asia, Governor Tamaki and previous governors too have had constructive and important things to say about Okinawan economic development and the importance of uh, considering that as well as the ideas here, but our discussion in this case, of course, does focus particularly on uh, FDEMA itself. So to take um, some of the questions that have already arisen, um, one, the fir first one has to do with the options that uh, exist, either keeping FDEMA as a former Consul General Mayor uh, was posing this question, whether it be uh, better to keep FEMA uh, or to reduce uh, the burden on it by moving to Hinoko was a bifurcated question. Uh, so that question, I believe, does go to Governor Tamaki, uh, first of all and others if they would be interested in commenting on that. The answer, I guess, is to some extent implicit in what's been said thereafter, but Governor um, 
that question was addressed to you, uh, and I wonder if you uh, would have some initial remarks. はい、私からでそれではえ、答えさせていただいてよろしいでしょうか。はい。よろしくお願いいたします。はい。まずこのあの、今の質問の選択肢が2つだということです。え、1つは普天間の機能をそのまま維持することで、もう1つは、え、
、えー、外務省がアメリカから渡された文書であるということで、えー、あの鳩山総理に示したんですが当時は、えーえー、とキルトキルトローターの,あの中型のヘリコプターが普天間に配属されていました CH48 という機種だったと思いますがその CH48 が飛んでいける航続距離が実は、えー、非常に短くて沖縄からあの他の地域に移してもその飛行、えー、継続距離を保つことができない。つまりあの沖縄以外に選択肢はないというペーパーを渡されたんですね、そしてそれで説明を、えー、されたというように言っています、後に鳩山総理はそのペーパーの存在を確認したところ、そういうペーパーは米国にも日本国内にも正式なペーパーとしては存在しないということになったんですね、そして、えー、その鳩山政権時代の選択肢は他にないと言われていた当時は、その CH48 という航続距離の短い、運べる人数も少ない、そして乗せる荷物もあまり多く積めないというヘリコプターでしたが、今や先ほどあのドクター・ブルックスがおっしゃったように、オスプレイは航続距離も積める、えー、機材の量も、そして運べる人間の量も、桁違いに増えているんですね。それを考えあしかもオスプレイは空中給油ができるという利点がありますそれを考えると実はその結論辺野古以外にないという結論はその結論を出した後で普天間で運用されるこのヘリコプターからオスプレイに切り替わりもはやもう普天間にこだわる理由は戦力的にも存在しなくなったということで状況が変化したというふうに見ています。Thank you very much.、Um, related to that, someone is asking about the situation today.、Uh, are there uh, uh, today、uh, C 130s and other cargo aircraft that are still、uh, using、uh, FDEMA? Oh, so no, you, yes, please, Governor. Hi. 空中給油機はあの岩国ベースに移,転、えー、と移設をしたということになっています、えー、ですから現在は普天間にはありません普天間にあるのは、えー、主にあの地上で訓練をする海兵隊員を運ぶ、えー、オスプレイや、えー、ヘリコプター、えー、および、まあ、あのその他の、えー攻撃型のヘリコプター、連絡型のヘリコプターなどだというように言われています。I see.、Um, thank you very much. We have another very interesting question from Ambassador Russ Deming, who, as you may know, has been with the Reichauer Center for many years and, of course, played an important role in、uh, U.S. Okinawa relations, as his father actually also、uh, did.、Um, and Ambassador Deming asks, Um, about base issues beyond FEMA and the FRF.、Uh, there, he's asking、uh, what issues are there, base issues that go beyond、uh, the、uh, FEMA and OCO issues that you're talking about now that are of most concern to you? And also, is the Japanese government and the US government are they addressing those issues? In some ways, I know that might be a, di a difficult question, but certainly an important one, and that all of us are interested in your thoughts. Of course,、uh, over the years, there have been a whole range of other, for example, base consolidation,、um, you know, and different improvements and, and redu reductions in problems that, that could be、uh, achieved. はい、では、えー、お答えいたしたいと思います。あのーえー、いわゆるその住宅地のど真ん中に
、えー、あり続ける普天間基地は文字通り沖縄における、えー、基地の閉鎖返還へのプロセスが試されている問題であるというように思います。ですから、えー、そういうようないわゆる、えー、騒音、そして、えー、PFAS の漏出などの環境汚染、えー、そして実はあのこの基地を運用するにあたっては夜間の飛行は、えー、なるべく行わないという、えー、夕方あ夜10時から朝の6時までは、えー、夜間飛行は、えー、行わないというような協定も取り決められているんですがその協定も結果的に米軍が夜間の、えー、演習を行うということが優先され結果的にはその協定すら守られていないという状況です。ですからそういう状況が守られていないということがそもそも、えー、この日本政府と米国とのさまざまな協定のいわゆる住民に対する、えーまあ、約束といいますか信頼性といいますかそういうものがあ全く果たされていないという現実があります。そして、えー、私たちは実は来年沖縄県は1972年にその当時のアメリカから、えー、日本へ市政権が返還されました。来年で50年になるわけです。我々沖縄県は今現在、えーえー、1万8000ヘクタールでしたっけね。1万8000ヘクタールを米軍の基地や、えー、訓練などのエリアに提供していますが、来年、えー、その復帰50周年にあたり、この佐古合意が合意されても 69% でしかない米軍の基地を一層 50% まで、えー、日米両政府がしっかりと数値を設定して、さらに、えー、基地の返還を進めるべきであるというようなことを沖縄県の考えとして申し入れさせていただきました。そのの場合にはどこの基地を返せどこの基地を閉鎖しろということの具体的なものを求めたわけではありません。それは日本とアメリカ政府がしっかりと協議をすること。そして実は佐古合意そのものも沖縄県民の考え方やプランが取り入れられた計画ではなっていないため、その今後の米軍基地の削減のための協議には必ず当事者である私たち沖縄県もその協議の場に加えて、しっかりと、えー、日本政府、アメリカ政府、えー、沖縄県などのきちんとした、えー、役割の場を、えー、設けるべきであるということも合わせて申し入れをさせていただきました。ですから、あの基地問題がデッドロックになってしまっていては、えー、沖縄県民の現実的な平穏な暮らしが、えー、手に入るとは考えられません。そういう負担を現実的に軽減していくこと、これが私は誠実な民主主義国家の進むべき方法であり、考え方ではないかというように思います。Well,、uh, thank you very much. And those of us who have spent time in Okinawa, of course, we realize the importance of these issues, but、uh, in some cases also the difficulty. I don't know. Of course, Ambassador Shear is. No longer、uh, in the government and no longer responsible, but he has、uh, great experience. He was one of the、uh, involved with the、uh, Sako talks in their very early days and across the years. I don't know. Uh, uh, Dave, do you have some thoughts about、uh, the issues that、uh, the governor has just raised? Going back to Bill's presentation, I, I think Hanoko is strategic.、Um, even if you can only park, even if you can only operate helicopters and V-22s out of Hanoko, it, it will be strategic. And it, it, nowhere else in Japan can, nowhere else in mainland Japan in particular, can replace that kind of、um, uh, closeness to. The, the Senkakus, for example, or to the Taiwan Straits. So,、um, I, the, the Marines are going to have to, Marines primarily operate with V 22s, and, and the, the Hanoko facility has been designed to accommodate V 22s. On the subject of、um, three way discussions,、um, we've had periodic three way discussions 
in Okinawa among the uh, Consul General, the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs representative in Okinawa and representatives from the Okinawa prefectural government. But when it comes to overall base issues um, and the, the status of forces in Japan, those are, those are discussions that we negotiate directly with the Japanese government. And we don't, we, we don't negotiate with prefectural governments <laughs> and or elsewhere overseas. Well, uh, I don't know whether, Bill, you would like to add anything there. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, uh, my uh, term strategic was not uh, aimed at the, uh, uh, the Ospreys, the MB-22s. It was aimed at uh, uh, fixed-wing aircraft in general. And I can cite um, a GAO report uh, that I discovered uh, uh, it's, it's GAO report in 2017, April 2017. The report criticized the, quote, capability deficiency of the planned runway at Camp Schwab, unquote, uh, uh, replacing uh, Futema's 9,000-foot runway with a much shorter one. Uh, and the report says uh, this equates to the loss of an emergency landing strip for fixed-wing aircraft in the area and loss of the United Nations use of a runway. Uh, the uh, DOD then uh, told the GAO that uh, at that time, an alternate, uh, alternate runway uh, to Futema for such a contingency is, is not a priority. So uh, uh, it may be important for the Ospreys, but they still don't have a backup runway uh, for the fixed wing aircraft. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, there is an important question, it seems to me, that's posed in our discussion here. Uh, Governor Tamaki, of course, talked about the softness of the ground and, and uh, Dr. Brooks as well. And um, Ambassador Shear notes that uh, this, and actually Dr. Brooks as well, that at this point, um, the plan seems to be for or the capability perhaps to put it that way of uh, the Hinoko facility would be for ospreys and helicopters in other words rather light um, aircraft if that is true i mean certainly there's the strategic question that, or the the issue of uh, location that dr brooks raises but doesn't that does that mean if only ospreys and um Heli helicopters are involved that the current construction, even if it's soft, would be appropriate uh, for the facility. Clearly an expensive facility, but not really a dangerous facility. Those, uh, some people uh, present uh, that argument, and I wonder how uh, Governor Tamaki uh, would respond to that. あの例えばその普天間にあるオスプレイの機能を維持させるそして地上部隊と一緒にオスプレイと訓練を行うその機能が担保されるのであればそれは私は沖縄にこだわらなくてもいいのではないかと思いますまああのそれが 日本に近い国外のどこかの場所なのかそういうことについては検討する必要があると思いますが私はこの軟弱地盤が広範囲に広がりそして浅い部分の埋め立てと深い部分の埋め立てによって土地の地盤沈下が違うケースがかかる問題つまり浅いところはそんなに深くは沈まないんですが深いところはより深く沈んでいくこれはその辺野古に作ろうとしている基地の作った後のいわゆる運営上かかる経費がおそらく莫大なものになるであろうという問題すら払んでいると思います
Thank you. Um, now, I'm sure that there are other questions uh, relating to the details of them uh, itself. Well, we're um, right, waiting for some of those. I see that there may be one or two more, but one question uh, from um, the Congressional Research Service, uh, M Emma uh, Chanley Averett, has to do with political uh, trends in Okinawa itself. Um, recently, of course, there have been some LDP uh, victories at the local uh, level. And she supposes that perhaps there's been in Okinawa, a change in Okinawa and views on the China threat, particularly among young people that might be responsible. Of course, not clear. We're very much interested in your sense of prospects as we move to the future for the views of the Okinawan people on, you know, in the local elections, in the future uh, gubernatorial elections and so on, given that, uh, of course, the situation regarding U.S.-China uh, relations has changed. Is this affecting public opinion on some of the base-related issues? And if so, how? How do you think? はい、えー、では、えー、お話しさせていただきたいと思いますあの確かにあの先の衆議院議員選挙では、えー、この辺野古の、えー、地域である名護市を含む選挙区では、えー、立憲民主党ではなく自民党の候補が、えー、勝利しましたつまり、えー、移設を容認している候補ですねそして、えー、第四選挙区でも移設を容認している自民党の候補が勝ちました。しかし、普天間飛行場がある選挙区は、この辺野古の移設に反対をするという候補が勝ち、そして最も多くの人が住んでいる那覇市を中心とする選挙区でも、辺野古移設に反対するという候補者が勝ちました。ですから、そのような選挙の結果は、おそらくそのそれぞれの候補者のどういう政策を主張し、県民がどういう政策について、えー、その判断をしたかということが私は、えー、大きなその勝敗の要因だろうと思います、えー、しかしあのこの3区その辺野古を含む選挙区の、えー、候補者は、えー、当選した候補者は実は自分が容認する立場なのでということであえて選挙戦の時にこの辺野古の問題を私は容認するから。私に投票してくださいというような発言はしていなかったというふうに聞いていますつまりあまり辺野古の問題を表に出していなかったというようなそういうスタイルだったんだと思いますそれから中国に対する沖縄の見方が変化したのかということですが確かに、えー、昨今の,あの報道では、えー、米中の緊張関係台湾を含む緊張関係のニュースがかなり紹介されますし沖縄県においても中国の海警局の艦船が尖閣諸島周辺で排他的経済水域や領海に一時的に侵犯をするという事態がほぼ連日続いていますしかしそれはまたそういうことをエスカレートさせてはいけないというように日本の海上保安庁は冷静に対処をしているという状況ですからそこで何か突発的な状況が、えー、起こるということは、えー、双方とも、えー、そこに踏み込まないような、えー、状況が続いているというように思いますあの沖縄県民は沖縄県は特にあの中国との、えー、古くて長い長考、えー、つまりあの、えー、親国として貢ぎ物をし中国からさまざまなものを賜るというそういう琉球王国の歴史長い歴史450年に及ぶ長い歴史を、えー、県民の皆さんはしっかりと分かっていますですから、え
、多くの県民の皆さんは、えー、中国と日本国との関係については、えー、平和的にお互いが共存できる、そういう外交を進めるべきだという声の方が圧倒的に多いことは間違いありません。ですから、あの例えば先ほども話がありましたけれども、あの経済で二、えー、国間どころかたくさんの国々が複雑に、えー、成り立っているという現状から考えるとその経済における優位性をどのような立場で、えー、戦略的に描いていくのかということの方が私から見るとこ軍事的な、えー、対抗よりも現実的な、えー、経済の問題をしっかりと重視するそういう関係が成り立っているという現実もまた合わせて考える必要があるのではないかと思っています。Thank you very much.、Um, we are coming very close, of course, to the end of our appointed time. I think all of us have learned a lot. I just have to say、uh, one last thing、uh, myself from you know, 16 trips to Okinawa when I was in the government. And I know others,、uh, Ambassador Scheer, Ambassador Deming, Dr. Brooks, you know, have、uh, much more of a deeper experience. But, Something I think that we all have learned is the,、um, the beauty of Okinawa, of course, the welcoming sentiment of the Okinawan people.、Um, and I know yourself, you're a musician and you have a very broad range of interests and background. And also, I should add,、um, on the economic side, I think. All of us, beyond、uh, these issues that we've discussed here today,、uh, which are very important, especially in the context of the changing、uh, world, the question of the development of Okinawa, of a broader relationship, a more a productive relationship with the world, deepening ties、uh, with the United States, with、uh, Asia, are things that are very important. So,、uh, we appreciate your participation here.、Um, I thank my、uh, two colleagues for their comments. And、um, we look forward to continuing this important discussion concerning Okinawa and the world. Thank you very much,、uh, Governor Tamaki. It's our a pleasure, and thank you, colleagues, and thank you to, to our audience. Thank you,、uh, Governor. I, hopefully, you have been able to hear, hear our remarks, but thank you very much、uh, for participating, and we look forward to、uh, continuing this dialogue. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Hopefully, we hope. ぜひまたこの素晴らしい対話の機会を使っていただければ、私も積極的に参加をしていきたいと思います。あのもっともっと沖縄の魅力もいっぱい皆さんに語りたいと思いますのでどうぞ今後とも沖縄ラブよろしくお願いします。ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。